Scholarship and Scholarly Resources in the 21st Century. Remarks by Paul DeGood at the ARL CNI Fall Forum, October 2011. Convened by Tom Leonard. Nice to see, feel this energy. It's particularly surprising to me to feel this energy because I can see people out there uh, like myself. I'm Tom Leonard. I'm the university librarian from Berkeley. But there are many others out there who have been on Planet Marriott talking, <laughs> talking about collections for a solid week. And it's quite an experience. One of the early tweets in these conversations uh, uh, warned us to beware of bike shedding. Bike shedding turns out to be a very good English word, though I had to look it out. Um, and it's the danger of paying attention to small matters while a large structure is unexamined. And this morning we are in no danger of bike shedding because my colleague from Berkeley, Paul Duguid, will never let that happen. Paul is a professor in the School of Information at Berkeley. He's also a research professor in the School of Business Management at Queen Mary University of London. As um, all of you know, uh, well, many of his accomplishments, but I think all of you know that he is a co-author with John Seeley Brown of The Social Life of Information. Paul has also written prize-winning articles on the history of trademarks, something he's now in Washington actively engaged in researching, and um, also widely cited articles on the community of practice and the future of education. Before turning to uh, academic life, Paul worked on a Silicon Valley research center of legend, Xerox Park and he founded and ran a small reprint publishing company. Um, I didn't know that he also managed a London book uh, shop and worked, at, worked in, in book production uh, with New York publishers. He truly covers the landscape. Paul, welcome to Planet Mary. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for those uh, very kind words, that, that kind introduction, and, and thank you to the uh, ARL for, for this opportunity to come and speak. Um, it's a great pleasure, but I, I have to say it's, it's a daunting pleasure. One of the uh, aspects, I think, of coming from the School of Information, which is a kind of field with no boundaries, is that you find yourself regularly talking to audiences where the audience knows more about what you're trying to talk about than you do, and that's a pretty intimidating experience, and I think it'll be true again today. So I shall probably wander all over the place in an attempt to evade your expertise while seeming, as it were, to address it. Um, so I should see if that I, can, I can pull that one off. Um, I, I thought that I, I, in some ways I should try to establish some credentials at least um, the thing to say, obviously, is, well, I use the library. Um, so so my mine is, 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 as it were, a view from across the, the, the counter. I actually had an encounter with Tom about a week ago. I was coming out of the stacks. I was carrying a book I had checked out, and I was walking towards the Bancroft collection to introduce a student to that room. And it seemed to me it was clearly such a setup on my part that Tom would never believe it was coincidence. You know? His faculty in the library borrowing books. You know, so, so, but, 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 but there I was. It, it was genuine. But I also thought, well, I should try some other way to establish credentials. So I dug in my desk and filled the, 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 the screen of my, uh, or, or the scanner, the bed of my scanner with all the library cards that I had amassed of, of late on, on them. I, I got, I think there's some 25 on there and there's about half a dozen that, that I couldn't get on at the time. So I thought, well, maybe that'll give me some sense of, of credentials. But on the other hand, 
friend um, coming, as it were, from the other side of the, of the counter. I don't want to pretend, although I know the theme today is collaboration, that there necessarily is this cosy relationship. Well, you know there isn't a cosy relationship between scholars and librarians. And although there are clearly incidents uh, that raise that, I mean, I think there are sort of structural tensions that are worth drawing attention to as well. One, I was, um, I, I encountered kind of unintentionally a few years ago when I was uh, teaching in Denmark and I had an interview with uh, one of the senior members of the da Danish National Library and he was telling me about some of the stuff that they had been digitizing of late and I sort of not thinking just began a sentence and saying uh, and what about and he slammed the table and he said you, you scholars you're just like the readers of pornography he said it's more 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 and never enough <laughs> So I, I retreated gracefully as, as gracefully as I could from that position, but I now think of myself as this wide-eyed pornographic hunter. <laughs> Whenever I go into the library, and particularly the digital collections, um, I, I think there's another one too uh, that came up a little yesterday as I was talking to the in, listening to the introductory talk yesterday, and that is that there is a way in which, as scholars, we get our credentials by finding stuff that nobody has ever come upon before. And that's terribly important for the advancement of scholarship. But then, of course, what we do is we turn to the librarians and say, why haven't you been collecting this stuff all this time? And again, there's clearly a, a tension between the two to put that demand that, that what for us is a new discovery should for libraries be old hat and they should hang on to it. Um, the so tensions I, I want to talk about today a little more, too, are what I see as sort of competing narratives. I think in the world of information at large, and I think this comes over to the library, and particularly to the libraries I'll talk about as it sort of looks at digitization projects of one sort or another. There is the, the great Stuart Brand quotation that information wants to be free. Now, he also said soon after that, information wants to be expensive, and boy, do we know that on certain occasions. But I think actually that the other side that perhaps needs thinking about as well is actually the one that information often needs to be constrained. That is the idea that we can just pull the constraints away and let the information out, which underlies a lot of thinking, I think is a problematic one. Um, I think along with that question then of the, uh, the notion of constraints being actually, and it's always problematic to say constraints are important. Again, it brings me back to my pornography role, I suppose. But the, um, the, the, the notion in some sense that we can, and that this came from working for a long time with, with engineers, that constraints and resources are things that are easily separable. And so when engineers come to a project, what they really want to do is remove the constraints and enhance the resources. And I think one of the strange things about information is that many of the constraints we manage to turn in social practice into resources and that's what makes making this division as I'll try to make clear apart. So I have no idea really how many slides I'm going to get through today but I'll see but if I do this is sort of the map of the territory. Uh, I've stolen some titles of books that are in many ways I think are indicative and wonderful books though not addressing this field. Polanyi's The Great Transformation and clearly if we're worried about collections in the 21st century it's partly because we feel we've gone through a great transformation but on the other side, scholarship, I think, and looks in many ways at itself as part of the great tradition, that now unreadable F.R. Levis book. Um, and those two clearly are in tension. Uh, I, uh, I taught once many years ago at a high school in England, Shrewsbury High School, which had been around for about 600 years. And Darwin had gone there, Philip Sidney had gone there, whoever, whoever had gone there. It was a tedious place. But whenever you suggested something new at a faculty meeting, someone would sit up and say, well, we haven't done that for 500 years. Why should we do it now? Which was, which was a showstopper that you could never, never find. So the, the great tradition in there. And then the third is to sort of, well, what does this discussion bear on libraries? And because it's always important to flatter your audience, I will say, what about the great libraries then? Um, so to, to go through that, the, the, the great transformation then is because we're in the age of information. 
and everything we'd like to think has changed. Uh, the wonderful uh, advertisement by IBM in Fortune in 1977 saying, you know, the information, it's the age, name of the age we live in. And from that came the sort of Stuart Brand stuff about information wants to be free. And even more, we get things now. I mean, the idea that information is capable of freedom is an interesting question. The idea that information has wants is even stranger in a way. But then you get Kevin Kelly coming along and saying we're now subservient to what technology wants. And Kevin Kelly, if you know him, loves to have these kind of logarithmic scales that just go off the charts. And then you sort of get at the bottom sort of human culture and scholarship pegging along in a linear relation. And, that. and how do these two come, come together is part of the question. Uh, out of that, then, we get this sort of sense that information is constrained by these technologies and is just dying to burst out. And those of you who know Kilgore's book, The, the Evolution of the Book, and of course Kilgore was you know, the founder of OCLC, he's, he's one of yours, as it were, writes this influential book, which has this sort of path up in the top. You know, We go from clay to parchment to codex to printing, and we're going to end up with the electronic book. And this is simply a linear passage all to do with our search for information or information's determination to free itself from constraints. And I still think many people do see the e-book and digitization as part of a simple linear account like this. That gives way in some ways to what I think of as the mountain view. Uh, when Google came along in some ways to digitize the books, it saw it. saw itself as engaged in the kind of act of liberation. It was storming the Bastille in many ways. They said, as Dan Clancy said to me, we went to libraries because that's where the information is. You know, We're going to let it out. It's Bastille Day. They're, they're, they're going to go free. And referred to things like books or libraries as the artificial impediments that stop us from getting to information. And, and, and it's a nice story. And of course, what you get, then get is the stuff that's born digital in a way is born free and has no constraints at all. And the old stuff we want to put on a similar fitting to the new. It's a, it's a, it's a notion, I think, of information that I, I like to call, with apologies to John Irving, the world according to GREP. That is that everything should be easily accessible to, to, to run searches over. And all that scholars do in a way is just search around among this stuff for patterns of one sort or another. Uh, I, I shouldn't pass on, by the way, in case anybody has uh, not seen this morning times. If we're going to talk about GREP and Unix, Sadly, Dennis Ritchie, you know, died yesterday, which is a sad thing that deserves acknowledgement. Um, okay, so this idea, I think, that we live with very widely, that there's this kind of emancipation, also leads to this notion of an information explosion. The School of Information at Berkeley, I think, pulled off a remarkable coup when the former librarian, Peter Lyman, and Hal Varian, who founded the school, wrote this sort of pamphlet, How Much Information?, which measured the amount of information in the world. And now nobody can really talk about amounts of information without citing this book, which is always great for the publicity of your school if it comes from it. Um, and it again sort of said, look, there's really nothing between the byte and the exabyte and the petabyte. You know, that it's simply the world is made up of information and we can count it. It had a sort of interesting effect in some ways. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the Wikipedia list of unusual measurements, but there among them, of course, is the Library of Congress. It's now simply a measure of information. You say, oh, this is now 25 times the amount of information in the Library of Congress. And libraries are simply going to get left as this residual unit of measurement. People will scratch their head and say, oh, I wonder what that was all about. Um, another part of this world, I think, is that with this liberation, we've had a social liberation. And this has, I think, a very different view of collaboration in many ways from rather an intentional and collective act to just lots of individual people having their behavior coordinated through technology. And so open source technology has been used as the uh, uh, software has been used as the paradigm for this. Lots of people writing stuff together and it just emerging wonderfully as, as, as Linux or whatever. Crowdsourcing Web 2.0 and, and the canonical books of this, the Surawiki on the wisdom of crowds and the crowd is much more intelligent than the individual scholar or whatever, etc. <laughs> Yokai Benkler on the wealth of networks, playing off Adam Smith and Clay Shirky on Here Comes Everybody with his strong idea that nobody is going to read books ever again. War and peace, it's past. And one more part of that story, I think, then is about academia and that really the school's time is up. 
Bill Bommel called uh, uh, the academia part of the stagnant services. And if you're looking at these wildly exponential growth curves of technology, you don't really want to be a stagnant service left behind. So there we are. And more and more you get these stories. I mean, Phoenix in some way was the beginning of saying we're going to burst out from these old constraints. We don't need them anymore. Khan Academy, for those of you who've come upon it, is now hugely, hugely successful on the web. Simply as one figure posting lots and lots of how to uh, videos on YouTube. Stanford, you will probably have read about recently, has opened an AI course to just anybody who wants to take it online. And MacArthur, a more extraordinary one, it sort of makes me feel remember my days in the Boy Scouts, wants to kind of award badges to people who somehow have done some meritocratic learning but haven't done it through an institution of higher education so don't have a degree. So MacArthur will give you a little sort of shoulder badge to say that you've done that. But all these are ways of saying that these old institutions, which includes libraries of course, but I'm also thinking of my world, which includes scholarship, are past because the new world of information is with us. And the question then I suppose is for you, obviously where does the library fit into this and the options in some way are, well we can go with the dynamic technologically driven world or we can stay with you stagnant scholars who seem unable to get out of the mud and your choice is sort of obvious and, and, and I feel that sort of tension when I, I deal with libraries in some way is librarians sometimes seem to me to be thinking of themselves almost as technologies if not in service of technology so I'd like um, at, at the risk of repetition uh, in, in some ways to go, to go through much of that a second time, but maybe temper the story a little and say, well, what does this look like if you take the, the view rather of the great transformation as this inevitable and ineluctable and necessary change and say, well, there's some ways in which telling that story is kind of problematic. One that interests me and for, for many different reasons uh, is in fact this phrase, the age of information which IBM picked up in 19... 77 um, comes up in fact in 1778 when this strange man Vicesimus Knox suddenly refers to his age as the age of information. Now why? Why, why would, what right has he to think that we're the age of information? Um, it, I mean, it, it's interesting, it's not long after, four years after Donaldson versus Beckett, I mean, there is a huge change in the nature of copyright and the nature of publication. He was one of the great publishers of uh, collections. He's the, the, the author, or the, the editor of Elegant Extracts, which is a book that some of you will know, hugely, hugely influential, which compiled a lot. He was a great... Um, proponent and got into a great deal of trouble for supporting the, um, uh, the French Revolution. Not a good thing to do in England a few years after this. Um, he was also a great supporter of education for all and in particular women's education. He was a very forward-looking man in, in many ways. Um, but yet he looks at the age of information and he is unlike many, I think, are up today, is sort of troubled by it in some ways. And what's interesting about the argument that he's making here is, well, well, books are great. They seem to be everywhere. Everybody has access to information. That's why he calls it the information. But perhaps that's not quite enough. And oddly here, for all his looking forward, he's actually echoing a remark, you know, uh, the thought in some ways of Socrates way back in the Phaedrus when he has to contemplate the invention of writing. And it's not so much that he despises writing, but he says there's something about interpersonal human communication that is lacking. And Knox kind of echoes this argument again as he comes up with this phrase, the age of information. So we're not the first to think of ourselves in this way. And there are some ways in which this kind of caution is worth remembering. Uh, well, one of the, the more extraordinary, for me, ways of, of, of looking at this is to consider this idea of just counting information and saying, boy, that, you know, that tells us so much. And we know it's quite extraordinary, not only how much information there is in the Library of Congress, but how much there is in the world. And there have since the first study of this, there have been about five, and there's one underway at the moment, and they come up with yet more. Well, what they usually come up with is new, new units of measurement, you know, the petabyte, the terabyte, the exabyte, and on and on. Um, but the intriguing thing, which, um, in fact, one of my students in the room, he'll shudder at the memory probably, is that we, um, uh, at Berkeley, actually, I ask... Uh, as part of a class, the students who come in and read this and full of it, I actually say, okay, count how much information there is in this room. And 
Go home and count how much there is in your apartment. How much information do you have on you? And you discover it's an impossible task. Uh, so uh, on the ground, it sounds like something we can add up, but in fact, it almost has no meaning. And the other question is, if you work out, if you can say, well, look, we'll count every, we'll, we'll, we'll simply count how much it, how many bytes you produce when you digitize a book, and therefore we know how many bytes there are in this particular book, it's again a question, where does it get you? I, I put the scales up there. Some of you, those of you who remember perhaps reading The Frogs, will remember that Aristophanes has this great scene where he weighs the works of Aeschylus versus um, uh, Euripides because uh, he can think of no other way to compare their work. And it's just if I, well, so, so he says, so we're gonna, how, how can we judge these two great writers? Well, we'll just weigh them, weigh their works one against the other. And, and this has some of that logic, and yet we find it very plausible, and it drives us in many ways. Um, again, revisiting Kilgore's story. And it's this great evolutionary story, and as he said in the quotations I put up earlier, it's about us wanting to get at information, or these different technologies that get in the way of it. And we go through from, from stone to parchment to the codex. But in fact, if you look at the history of that, it's an extraordinarily different story. Um, China is you know, the first to produce paper. And it takes 1,500 years to get to Western Europe, which we think of as the great center of learning in the world. Whereas if we look at the codex... Western Europe is very early to get to the Codex, which Kilgore sees so important, and the Chinese are surprisingly late, and when they do, they come in with the Sutra Codex. And if we put that next to printing, the Chinese are then at first, print, first with printing, and Western Europe is surprisingly late, although we like to think that we invent it. And our excuse is, of course, well, no, because we invented typography, but in fact, we were almost rather late to invent typography. So if you want to tell a linear story about how these technologies are simply driven by information and they unfold with a technological logic, it simply doesn't work. But it's a nice story with which to comfort ourselves. And that brings me then to, to, to one of the sort of central issues that I, I, I want to talk about in that day today, and that is the nature of the book. Because in part we're trying to say, I was talk yesterday, um, you know, I live with large bundles of e-books that I travel with in different forms. Um, the one thing it, that, that has become a sort of center of a battle in which you either have to be for or against, and you're either going to move with the world or stay, or stay locked in the past. Um, the first quotation is from Nicholas Carr, who sort of puts the old worldview there and says, you know, I can't even read anymore because of these new technologies. They're so distracting, they break up my mind. The old linear reading of the text has gone. And there's the terrible sort of voice of the past that we're losing. And new librarians who are digitizing things are the fault. Now, there you are. On the other hand, you know, there's James Glick, who is not here actually directly arguing against a car. In fact, in some ways, I think, sub of this article that was in the Times, he was arguing against Robert Danton, in fact, I think, because he talks about books that have marginalia, and then he's wonderfully scornful and says, well, we can digitize all that too. And he comes up with this idea that, you know, what the sort of car position is, is one of sentimentality and fetishization. And it really isn't something that we should take seriously at all. Um, so those, I think, are the sort of two positions. Um, I think it's a highly problematic position, and it's one that makes me, in some ways, particularly uh, upset with the way in which we've taken on the world of e-books. Um, on the outside of the British Library for some time, it may still be there at the moment, was the Samuel Johnson quotation, knowledge is of two kinds, we know a subject ourselves, or we know where we can find information upon it. There he is again, he's well, part of that age of information, the late 18th century. It's a great quotation, sounds wonderful. In fact, the, the scene in which, uh, some of you may know, in which he says that, is, is actually a sort of remarkable one, he's in a library. And uh, Boswell and one other person watch him go up to the books. And jo Bo Johnson, in a way that librarians know, comes up, grabs a book off the shelf, and immediately turns to the back of the book. 
And then he sort of looks inside and around and hands it up and down and turns around. And he actually, when they ask him about this, why on earth are you doing that? Why don't you sit down in the book and read from the beginning to the end? And he said, well, when we inquire into any subject, the first thing we have to do is know what books treat of it. This leads us to look in the catalogues and the backs of books. Now, and this is actually what scholars do all the time. I mean, the first thing we do is look in the index to see if we're there. Um, <laughs> If that fails, we, you know, we have a quick check through the bibliography in case somebody misindexed us. Um, we, we read books in part by sticking a finger in one place. Not library books. We don't put stickies in library books, of course. A finger in another place, looking in the back, moving from one part to another. Almost never do we move in a linear fashion from the front to the back of the book. And yet, how have we designed most of the technologies? How do we do most of our scanning? So we move from the front, as if we were to read like a good romance novel reader from the front to the back, waiting for the punchline in the end. And in fact, as you heard yesterday, many books actually go from the back to the front, and that confuses us even more. Um, So I actually think that the romanticization of the book is not, I hope, uh, though you may not by now think differently, simply people like me getting nostalgic. It's actually the technologists who have an idea that this is what books are like and how they should be used, but they don't read books. Um, and I think that hence gets me to think that among the great sentimentalists of our time, indeed, has been Google, with, dare I say, your support. Uh, I um, spoke to what I should say is a senior member of Google, just before they announced the Google Books agreement with the five libraries, as the Zen was. And he said to me, look, we're going to scan these books. Isn't it great? And I said, wow, that's extraordinary, X. Um, Which ones are you going to do? And he said, we're going to do them all. (laughs) And I kind of knew then that the thing was fated. Because nobody would go... I mean, there are many good things about what Google did. They went in there so naively, they did what others would never have done because of that. But on the other hand, they did it in a way which I think has been enormously damaging to digitization, to libraries, and to our understanding of how books are used. Um, I had to debate a senior member of the Google Book team at the American Historical Association last year, and he wanted, among other things, to insist that people at Google love books. And he said, I was reading you know, a book on the plane as I came down. He was talking to historians and he wanted to persuade, he said Frey, those great phrases like, you are our power users, we believe in you. And he said, and I was reading a book on the plane coming down here and he pulled out of his pocket. Um, it wasn't actually that book, but it was How to Improve Your Golf Swing. And I held my head in my hands and I thought, I mean, the fact that he thought that would impress the audience that he understood books was remarkable beyond all measure. Um, and so, to go very quickly through, some of you have seen my colleague uh, Jeff Numberg's piece on Google's digitization. He didn't actually call it a disaster for scholars. He called it a metadata disaster. Um, he gave it in front of a large number of people from Google who, who were not very happy. Uh, some of you will have read I mean, wonderful things in the collection. Madame Bovary, written by Henry James. Uh, I particularly like this one, Thomas Brown's um, Burial, that was uh, listed among gardening books. Um, <laughs> The, the, the Merchant of Venice's Foreign Language Studies, um, the, the autograph edition of Willa Cather by Bruce Rogers, um, there was uh, The Mosaic Navigator by Sigmund Freud. The, these were not pastiche, these were not made up. This was part of the Google collection. Um, one that I'm particularly fond of that announced that I wrote the Portuguese version of The Social Life of Information in 1899. Um, I look young for my age, I assure you. And my, my Portuguese has gone down a little since then. Um, what, uh, I mean, many of you will know, know of this stuff. Um, and in fact, we, what was intriguing was that while Jeff and by extension I were attacked and vilified by many people, many, people at Google actually thanked him. And they made, they said, a million changes almost immediately as a result of errors that he brought out in their system. But it got other responses. A 19th century scholar referring to me said, this was a kind of bibliographic fastidious. And I thought, that's really really great to know that Henry James didn't write Madame Bovary as fastidious. Well, let's roll on that. 
Um, Danny Sullivan, who some of you may know, who runs a very influential blog called searchenginewatch.com, which is the major commenter on Google from, from outside, and he got into a tussle with me online when I was talking about some of these problems. And he said, look, if I want to go skiing in Mammoth, the ski resort in California, he said, I just go to Google Books and it'll tell me what the average snowfall for that month is. And I get a Wordsworth phrase, was it for this? came to mind. Was it for this we scanned the great research libraries of America? <laughs> so, um, and the other was the extraordinary thing from Google, which we got again and again. It's the library's fault. You guys did it. It wasn't us. And we pointed out to them again and again, and nobody in the libraries put the BISAC categories in there, but the libraries got the blame. But in some ways, what disturbed me more were the responses we got from librarians. <coughs> Jeff and I, by a while, the uh, a widely read uh, librarian blogger, were accused of ranting for talking like this about Google. Uh, when Jeff spin it, finished speaking, the first person actually to stand up was a senior California librarian, not, I assure you, Tom, uh, who said, um, you know, they can find books other ways. And I thought, gosh, if you actually think that the reason for digitization is just to have another catalog to find books in the library, if you don't understand that the whole reason that scanning is so important to scholars is it gives us an entirely different resource for research, but one which needs to have good metadata to be reliable at all, you really don't understand very much about why this is such an important project and we care about it so much. And it seemed to me it went back to that very, I mean, Google has always changed how it characterizes the library, but an early goal of the project which I have up there, the library project aim is simple, to make it easier for for people to find relevant books. Well, that's not why we want a digital version of the library. That's not what research is really about, and that misunderstanding. Um, one that, again, made me particularly angry and came from librarians was the claim that librarians make such cataloging errors too. And with that, I saw several senior librarians, I think luckily none are in this room, basically throw their staff, as we say, under a bus. And in order not to appear in public, I felt to be seen to be criticizing Google, they were willing to say, well, we do that too. And I thought that, to be honest, was thoroughly, thoroughly miserable and shameful. Um, librarians make amazing cataloging errors. I come upon them all the time, but they're not in the same league. <laughs> they, they have a, a level of sophistication to your errors that I can only admire. Um, and so therefore to sort of make this specious comparison in order it seemed to me not to be seen to be technologically Luddite or not to be seen to be opposed to what was going on was again horrifying and again showed to me some distance between sort of librarianship and scholarship. Uh, one that also intrigued me, the, the, in some ways the, the, one of the trickiest ones to counter when you see those Kevin Kelly graphs of, of, of you know, logarithmic explosion, is you know, it will improve. Don't complain now because it will be better tomorrow. And for sure it is. It is getting better. But I, in fact, have had the sort of good fortune since it actually first came out to be monitoring one particular book. I had written an article about the Project Gutenberg version of Tristram Shandy. And I went to Google Books to see, you know, assuming, well, it's going to do it so much better. And Google Books was a, a rewarding disaster. And the nice thing is that five years on, it still is splendidly disastrous on this, in part because it doesn't know how to handle multi-volume works, because it doesn't acknowledge that there's anything other than the individual unit of the codex. Um, this is just a, the, the, the standard set of search results. Um, if, you, if you look at them more closely, I, think I probably can't read them on my screen now. Uh, some of them are splendidly bad. Um, uh, I, I like the one that says, if you've ever wanted to find out uh, more about the nature of Judaism or explain it to a friend, this is the book. Um, <laughs> now, now, Stern is a very batty author, but you can bet like hell that that's not in that book. <laughs> but what, in fact, is more worrying about this, and I think more serious, is that if you look at the second one, the Moby edition, which is there, 99 cents, readily available for all. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot, of course, the other thing you get with, with Google and its searches, of course, when you put this search in, as I did yesterday, you discover that there's one million plus copies 
of Tristram Shandy. This is what I always call the Google lie. You know, and then you wind four pages on and you just go, no, actually there's 40 hits in the search. They just thought it looked rather good on the first page to have a bigger number. Um, but if you actually go to the second edition here, the first, the first one up, it's volume one. They don't tell you how many volumes there are, how you can find the other volumes, etc., etc. But more intriguing for me, in a way, is that if you take the second edition, uh, it has this wonderful mishmash of the chapter outline on the contents page. And also when it comes to the opening Greek quotation, it says very nicely, two lines in Greek. <laughs> And the reason that it does that, of course, is because it's actually a scan of the Project Gutenberg edition. And the Project Gutenberg edition was taken from one of the most wonderfully defective 19th century editions of Tristram Chani. And Google has now made that high up as one of the first books that you will find. Something that you librarians have spent a lifetime putting in the further reaches of the library. So only scholars can find is now the, almost the first edition that anybody will stumble upon as an innocent reader. Um, another example which I, I, I always like is here's, here's Newt Hampson, uh, Pat, who the Nobel Prize winner. Here's his book Pan about this, this sort of sexually tormented uh, sailor. And this is where he first meets the, the woman who's going to torment him. And when she comes, my heart knows all and no longer beats like a heart but rings as a bell. I lay my hand on her. Tie my shoestring, she says with flushed cheeks. The sun dips down and the sea rises again. A touching scene, no doubt, and that's how you will find it on Google Books. Except that if you actually read it, the book by Penguin, it says, and when she comes, my heart understands all and no longer beats, it peels, and she is naked under her dress. Oh, we forgot that. That's just somehow... <laughs> Editorial problem. And I lay my hand on her. Tie my shoelace, she says with flaming cheeks. And a little later, she whispers directly against my mouth, against my lips. Oh, you're not tying my shoelace, sweetheart. You're not tying, not tying my... It's a rather different book, I would say. <laughs> but it's not the book that you actually find if you go straight there in Google Books and look for a readable edition. Because there's a little explanation that the first US edition by Worcester was burglarized. And here's this book about sexual neurosis from which all the sexual scenes have been removed. <laughs> And that, through Google Books and the Library Project, with your cooperation, is now the first available example of this Nobel Prize winner. Um, so, and it's not simply what's available now on Google Books, because of course these books are now all being taken by various concerns, wrapped in different ways and sold on the Kindle. So in fact, if you look at the Kindle edition of Tristram Shandy, there are about seven different editions of the Project Gutenberg via Google Books edition, which is the obvious thing to buy for 99 cents. So librarians and scholars having spent two generations, three generations, taking the worst editions and putting them as far as possible from the public reach, have now turned around and said, let's make these the most accessible editions that anybody would have. Scholarship worries a little. Um, and some of you may have seen, for instance, uh, the nice editorial in yesterday's New York Times talking about the British Library app, saying what a wonderful thing it is, the contents of the digital library. But in fact, if you look at what the librarian said about that, it was just basically this shelf of books that nobody was looking at down in the basement of the British Library, and they were the easiest to digitize. So just as Google went to all your repositories and put all those books that nobody was reading. So the British Library is doing this again and getting applause from the New York Times, but it doesn't seem to me to be the way to think about turning our libraries into to digital account. Um, I, just very quickly to say that I'm now sort of coming in one way to Google's aid. Some of you may have seen, uh, Tom said I'm working on trademarks, that Google is um, released not long ago all the patent and trademark information. And it's a wonderful thing for me, I wrote to Google and said for once I'm really grateful for you Dan, thanks for doing this and three weeks later I had to write back and say no I'm not. It's a stunning mess of the first 30,000 trademarks up, 7,000 are missing without any account of why. There are errors, there are typos, it's just a horrid, horrid, horrid and basically it was a kind of agreement with the trademark office to kind of raise its public profile and say this is public information, we should release it, but it goes in competition with all the private vendors who've been selling this stuff for so long. And again, there's a sort of sense that this is liberation, and it's not. 
uh, one of the things that, well, now let me, as I'm running out of time, pass on. Um, let me pass on from that too. So one thing I want to say that I think is going on here as we think of this world of liberation is that we have this nice linear account. So I should go back just one slide. Um, but in fact, if you look, for instance, at uh, Yochai Benkler's kind of these new great open network accounts, uh, open source is not this nice egalitarian world. It's tyrannical in the extreme. Linus Torvalds is the kind of old emperor that reigns over Linux. And in fact, if you look at the exchanges and the battles and the people who threaten to take guns to each other over different things, it's a very different world from that cozy world we like to expect. The other thing about open source, too, of course, is that it can crash. If you do something wrong, it'll fail. It ain't quite so true in some of these other worlds. Um, uh, you know, uh, he, he uses the idea of Paul Ginsberg's server and says, this is it, you know, it's just open, open. You talk to people at Cornell and they say, hang on, <laughs> this is no free and easy, low-cost way to, to provide new journals. It's very complex, very difficult, but we can idealize it once again. Uh, Wikipedia, I think, is interesting. It began with this great open attitude that anybody could edit. And that came apart fairly early on, and Wikimedia is now turning it back into much more of a top-down, organized, systematized approach, as indeed with Google Books, uh, where it seems to me that Hattie Trust has come along and is starting to give some adult supervision to what otherwise was highly problematic. Now, I'm going to go very quickly through this, but I just want to say that this, in fact, I think is a very long and old tradition. Uh, if we look at the law journal, Richard Posner has an article saying we're at the end of the law journal. Well, in fact, in the 1930s, they said it was the end of the law journal and tried to end it. In 1810, they said it was the end of the law journal and tried to end it and said anybody can edit law reports. But slowly over time, they said, no, there's a problem. We need some structure. We need some discipline here. We can always laugh at Sarah Palin. Here was the New York Times saying, Sarah Palin saying, you know, I don't need no medical degree to talk about medicine. I just know what's right and wrong. And we go, ho, 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 you know. But in fact, in the 19th century, America disbanded most of its medical accreditation societies. Washington, D.C. did in 1850 with Thomsonian medicine. You didn't need a degree. So we go through these moods of saying these institutional accreditations are problematic. Uh, you see it again in the early days of science. The Royal Society sets itself up, as Thomas Spratt says, for any man in a way to contribute. The greater things are produced the free way than the formal. The shift, I think, is nicely shown in the philosophical transactions. This is the first edition of the philosophical transactions with wonderful articles on the very odd relation uh, of, of a monstrous calf. You know, people just chucking stuff in and saying, it's like a blog, let's see what it's like. But before too long, you start to say, no, you have to have a bunch of initials after your name, you have to have accreditation and authority, and Newton starts throwing out a whole bunch of people who he doesn't want in there. Um, it, 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 it's, I think, very nicely sort of summed up by the wife of Bath. You know, experience and not authority is enough for me. It's this battle between experience and authority, and the 18th century was said between reason and authority. And we know that institutions get corrupt, and we try to throw them out, and then occasionally we say, hang on, we actually may need them back in again, because life without institutions is problematic. Uh, it's the world, I think, of scholarship. We spend a lot of time consensus building, and then we break down the consensus, but then we need to come back again and build those institutional consensus mechanisms back in again. Uh, we need to know about reliability, about authority, just as we occasionally need to rebel against them all. So, to come up very quickly, I've gone through all that because I actually think that that's an overlooked role that the library plays in many ways, is to instantiate that institutional authority. Um, it's actually there physically, those great round reading rooms, including the one in, in Washington. There was a world in which things were inside and things were excluded. There were things we had as library contents and things that are not. And so, to sort of sum up quickly what I want to say about my view of the library from the other side of the counter, is one is to borrow a phrase from Don Waters, who said to me long ago, look, what Mellon is interested in is scholarship, not libraries. 
And scholarship is the important endeavor here, if I may beat my little chest. Which I see you as collaborators in, but it still seems to me to be very important to say. And it's institutions, therefore, and not technology. And to see yourselves, therefore, as looking like information technology and driven by that rather than by institutional imperatives for all their corruption and backsliding. Uh, I think, therefore, to argue a little against what you're talking about, you have to think of the world of selections and not collections. Uh, that that's really what's going on here and we select some things and other things we refuse to collect a quality, not quantity and although we talked yesterday about global I think the local is enormously important and it's competition and not just collaboration um, that is, I think that we're going to end up before too long with a kind of common stock which will be available to everybody better done by Google, than Google Books but that will mean I was mentioned yesterday about special collections that the distinction of particular libraries will be in some way what we can think of as their value added to the process rather than simply offering yourself as transponders in the system that just passes things from one to the other and survival will come very much I think from that um, I, I won't go through all this because I'm running out of time but I think the question of you know, is it in the library will be a shifting judgment. It should no longer be a judgment on the library. Is the library adequate? It should be a judgment on the particular work or collection. Is it worthy of being in the library? And I think that's a kind of different decision from my point of view. Uh, let me pass over all that so that I can wrap up if I can. There, there was a, year, a lifetime of research in that slide. But... Um, <laughs> Um, uh, what, um, what I want to say is that one of the intriguing things about what we think of, I heard about the, the food chain yesterday, um, the library supply chain, is that supply chains are not little worlds necessarily of cooperation. They're worlds of extraordinary competition. The example I had back there, for instance, was the PC supply chain, where you saw Intel battling with Microsoft, battling with Dell, all of whom were meant to cooperate with one another, but only one of which was really going to draw profits from that plane, and it was going to draw the profits by subordinating the others and putting its own name first. And that was what was so brilliant about the Intel Inside logo. And I think that in some ways you're caught in a world like that now, particularly with the world of journal publishers. Uh, it's interesting that my students seem less and less to know what journal an article comes from. They know it's an article, but they don't know the name of the journal. But I think libraries in some way have to start putting themselves forward as saying, our name is on that. So, to sum up very quickly, I think that libraries of the 21st century within this world of institutional identity have to cultivate identity for the university, for the scholars, but to do that it actually has to cultivate its own identity. So if Tom will forgive me this, I see in some sense <laughs> that there is an identity to be given forth in this area. So I was coming upon, across the country about three years ago, and uh, in the four years ago, and I was meant to be teaching or, uh, by phone in a class, but I unfortunately was caught up in the airport and was on a plane at the time, so I gingerly picked up the telephone that they used to have in the back of the seat and began to blather down the phone line over a loudspeaker to a classroom somewhere, actually in Washington, D.C., I think it was. And when I put the phone back on the hook, the man in the seat next to me turned to me and I thought, what's he going to say? You know, he's listened to all this nonsense and he said, so that's what the view from 50,000 feet is all about. <laughs> If, if mine has seemed like that or more of that, I do apologize, but thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.